Well, Oregon is a sweet 16 caliber team, but they have to get through South Carolina. How do they do that? That's all coming up on SportsCenter right now. I'm kidding. This is the Locked On Network. Let's do it. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for a special Locked On crossover edition of Locked On Ducks and Locked On Gamecocks. I'm Spencer McLaughlin of the Oregon Ducks podcast, and that's Andrew Lyon of the South Carolina version of the podcast here. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the Ducks or the Gamecocks, depending on who you may be listening to or watching this show. Let's hop right into it, Andrew. An 11-6 matchup that, according to Vegas, is going to be a nail-biting thriller. Both teams are favored in various sports book sports books, which I, I I don't remember seeing all the time. I think this is just going to be a, a great first round March Madness game. We're going to get everybody ready with everything you need to do. What's the most important part of this game for South Carolina? Spencer, I think the most important part of this game for South Carolina is um, it's it's going to sound generic, but honestly, being able to operate the way in which they like to offensively. South Carolina, you know, if you're a big Ken Palm person or a numbers person, South Carolina is one of the slowest teams in the entire country in terms of pace. They're not going to fly around like an Alabama or a Kentucky or maybe at times like Gonzaga for those of you on the West Coast. They are going to swing the ball around the perimeter. They're going to try to look for some good matchups coming off of defensive switches. Sometimes they'll just try to feed the ball down low to a Colin Murray Boyles or a BJ Mack, two guys that will willingly work with their back to the basket, which, you know, again, something we don't see a whole lot nowadays in modern basketball. But for the Gamecocks, it's basically trying to get good looks. They're not going to just try to rely on skill and just pure shooting, um, just, just pure shooters. They're going to try and work together as a collective unit, which – is beautiful basketball to watch when it's clicking on all cylinders. But when they face a team defensively that can take something away or maybe multiple things away that they like to do, that's when things can get a little bit sticky for the Gamecocks. Defensively, the Gamecocks are one of the better units you're going to find all season. They're fundamentally sound. They try to work really hard to just stay in front of their guy. Again, I know it sounds simplistic, but that's kind of the method to the madness for Lamont Paris, the head coach of South Carolina. Basically, make everything more difficult. Just understand at times, shooters are shooters. Sometimes you're going to give up buckets. That's just the way the sport is now. Every team has got a couple of good shooters. But make it as difficult for them as possible over the course of 40 minutes. And at the end, you should have a good shot to win. That's the general philosophy for South Carolina. But the key to this game for them will be their offensive efficiency. Spencer, what about the Oregon Ducks? What do they have to do in order to Really like how this game shakes out for them. Well, it's interesting that, you know, in your initial response, you mentioned a back to the basket center, and that's not super common. And you're right. It isn't. It's more common in college basketball than in the NBA. But Oregon has one of the best back to the basket centers in the entire country in Enfali Dante, who is scorching hot coming into this game. And I think that interior matchup is a fascinating one. And quick note before I answer your question, Andrew. The Oregon-South Carolina line, according to our friends at FanDuel, official sports book of the Locked On Network, South Carolina favored by one and a half, the over-under 133 and a half. So they're expecting a grinded out sort of slugfest here because I think that with, with what South Carolina has you know struggled to do sometimes offensively, Oregon's had a lot of those same sorts of issues at times. Now, their defense has really picked it up, and we'll get to more of that later. But I think the biggest key in this game for for the Ducks is being able to hit threes. They have struggled mightily over the last couple weeks. They've made it work, and they have won games against good teams. They've beaten a trio of tournament-caliber teams in this four-game win streak. Utah didn't make the tournament, but they were on the bubble. Colorado is in the first four, and Arizona, of course, is a tournament team. So Oregon has played much better. But... In the second half of the Pac-12 championship game, they didn't hit a single three, not a single one. They were two for 17 on the game, and both those threes came in the first half. I think they got away with it against Colorado. The Buffs weren't hitting shots, and Oregon's defense was really good. Maybe against an offensively inconsistent team in South Carolina, that could fly here, but 
I'm not saying Oregon needs to go bonkers and hit eight to 10 threes. I think if they do, they're winning the game pretty handily. I don't expect them to, but you've got to be able to hit a couple shots from, from beyond the arc because I, I think in this sort of game where Vegas is expecting a slugfest, because remember, for those of us who struggle with math, and you know what, math is hard, I don't blame you, 133 and a half, that, that's about 67, 66, you know, in, like in, in, in that sort of range, they're expecting both teams to be under 70, which you could absolutely see. The last time Oregon was in the NCAA tournament, two, or sorry, it was a while ago, um, the, or the, sorry, the time before, the last time they won the Pac-12 tournament to get in, they made a run to the Sweet 16. They've done that two times, by the way, something I'll touch on a bit more later, but uh, when it comes to prediction time here on the show. But this Oregon team ha has had a propensity when they're playing oftentimes their best basketball to have low scoring games. They lost to Virginia the year the Cavaliers in the Sweet 16 won the national championship. That game, I believe both teams were under 60. So that, that could absolutely be where Oregon wants this game to go. And I think if they can just hit a couple threes, Jackson Shellstad and Jermaine Kuznard, Oregon starting backcourt, were one of nine from outside uh, in the Pac-12 title game against Colorado. If they can just make that three of nine, I think that can be a, a pretty significant boost. But what sort of challenge does South Carolina present defensively? Spencer, I think that defensively it all starts with South Carolina's um, with South Carolina's backcourt. So when you look at South Carolina, you look at Taylon Cooper. He is a fifth-year senior at that point guard spot. This will be Cooper's, I believe, second time in the NCAA tournament. He actually was uh, with Moorhead State two or three years ago in the tournament with Janai Broom, who is now a star big man for the Auburn Tigers, another potential national title contender in this NCAA tournament. But he's paired up alongside Michi Johnson, who came to South Carolina via Ohio State in Lamont Paris's first year this past season. Both of those guys, they sort of lead the charge defensively again. They are very good in terms of just getting down an athletic stance and not letting guards just blow right on past them. Taylon is big, he's stocky, and he's got length. He's 6'4", pretty big for a point guard. Michi, he's pretty much the explosive athletic guard out of that uh, backcourt for South Carolina. He's a guy that can take you off the dribble offensively and defensively. He will fight like hell going through screens to try to keep up with his man whenever he's on the run and he's tailing him. So those two guys are where it starts. In terms of the front court, it all starts with Colin Murray Boyles, six seven true freshman who will play the four spot. Uber athletic. He is going to play in the NBA one day. He missed pretty much all of non-con play with myonucleosis, and he did not really get going until about six weeks ago, Spencer. And since then, it's just like he has taken his play to a whole nother level. And defensively speaking, he can jump out the gym. He can get blocks. He stays in front of his guy. Even though he looks a little bit on the smaller side, he can do pretty well against guys that are a little bit bigger than him. So he won't probably be matched up against Infali Dante when he is in the game. That'll probably be BJ Mack. But don't be surprised if maybe they're having some trouble early on. They decide to have Colin try to act as sort of a help defender and assist maybe on some quick double teams if Infali is motoring early on in this matchup. So defensively for South Carolina, it's pretty much those three guys. Zachary Davis is their wing player. He's another good defender. Defense is pretty much where his strengths lie. Mack is probably the weakest defender. So admittedly, going up against Infali Dante, might not be a great sign. It might be interesting to see how that plays out the first few minutes of this matchup. Yeah, I think Oregon's done a great job of getting Dante the ball with, with a lot of favorable positions and looks over the last couple of weeks. In the Pac-12 quarterfinal against UCLA, they had a Dembona in foul trouble early in that game, and Dante went on to dominate with 22 points. He was a perfect 12 for 12 from the field and hit his only free throw for a 25.9 rebound effort in the Pac-12 tournament championship game, which got Oregon uh, this particular berth. We still got more to dive into with the matchup, and we'll talk about what these teams can actually accomplish, whoever moves on from the first round. First, we'll talk about better together, because if your bracket's already busted, which it could be by the time Oregon and South Carolina are playing, it's that sort of craziness in March Madness. They don't call it the madness for nothing. And you're tired of the same old daily fantasy grind where you make a roster, you cross your fingers and hope for the best, or you're losing on the last leg of your pickup entry, introducing better together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. You play alongside them, got the same rooting 
interests. Teamwork triumphs, and that is the motto. Pick more or less on a real-time player stat. Strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Anything in this game you can have available to you over at Better Together. If if, if you don't think South Carolina is going to be able to stop and follow Dante, well, then guess what? You can pick him to go over with your friend. Or maybe you think Dante's going to regress to the mean and have a little bit of a, you know, a regression game where he goes only 8 of 12 from the floor instead of 12 for 12. What a travesty that would be, of course. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. This episode also brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, what brings home the winning trophy, is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, Andrew, let's continue on here talking this matchup, which should be one in which points are, are kind of tough to come by. Oregon has been, as I mentioned, an inconsistent three-point shooting team. South Carolina maybe a little bit more defensively oriented. I think one reason that I feel confident about the Ducks in this spot, confident enough to pick them to win, stay tuned later in the show. But one reason I feel confident in the Ducks is the way that they have played defensively on this four-game winning streak. Utah to end the regular season, and then UCLA, Arizona, and Colorado, all good teams. You know, UCLA came on strong in the second half of the year. All of those teams have been held under 70 points. If you look at Oregon's losses in the non-conference early in the season to teams like Syracuse or Alabama, they were allowing 85, 90 or more points and they've really locked in at that at that end of the floor. The true freshman power forward that, that you mentioned, I think is going to be a, a matchup of true freshman power forwards in this game because Oregon's five-star recruit, K.J. Evans, has really, you know, he struggled a little bit offensively in the Pac-12 tournament, but defensively, he's been a beast and a real, real force. And what I think is interesting is if either of these big men that start for, for these teams get into foul trouble, do you bring in a five off the bench or do you take the four as a true freshman and slide him into that five spot? I think that matchup could be really, really intriguing. Yeah, Spencer, I agree with you 100%. And for South Carolina, I'll throw one more quick name out there. Uh, Josh Gray, he is sort of the backup center for the Gamecocks, and he's essentially a part of the Gamecocks' big lineup. BJ Mack, he, uh, according to the roster, he only stands at about six foot eight. Uh, maybe he's six foot nine if they're a little bit wrong, but um, Josh Gray is essentially going to be their big man. He's about seven foot two fifty two sixty. He's absolutely somebody that, from a size standpoint, he's going to be willing to go uh, banging down low with and folly Dante um, in this matchup. But the other thing about Josh Gray, they will say, is this: he the reason why he does not start for this team is he can also sometimes get into foul trouble. So I think that in this game. BJ Mack, South Carolina starting five, he's going to have to probably be willing to concede a little bit to Infali Dante. Listen, you'll give up twos over threes pretty much every single day of the week in basketball. But where he makes his biggest impact is on the offensive end. So BJ, he'll go on slip screens right around the three-point line, and Michi and Taylor will go one direction, while BJ will fake out a pick and roll. He won't go to the basket. He'll just stay back. Watch your big man tail, and then he'll get a pass, and then he'll shoot a three. He's got a really nice stroke from behind the arc. So I think that foul trouble is absolutely something that's going to be key in this game. It'll also be interesting to see how the refs call this game because, you know, I'm not sure if this is something that you will agree with, Spencer, but I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption here. Pac-12, not as many fouls called because it's probably a lot more, you know, sort of cut to the basket type of game, you know, sort of. More so play with your minds instead of, you know, your body. I'm just uh, assuming that based on the pack. Yeah, it, it, so, it, it, that, so it depends because, you know, Dana Altman has been vocally critical on, on the record of how and Folly Dante is officiated. 
and not from the standpoint of they call too many fouls on him or he's not. Altman's belief, I don't know that he's had to pay a fine for it yet, but Altman has stated several times he feels like because Dante is so big and such an imposing presence down there that he gets pushed a lot and it doesn't and it doesn't get called. And so I don't know what sort of officiating crews you're going to have. Certainly they've seen big men before, but have they seen a guy like Dante that matches his size and athleticism? I don't know. And so I agree that that is a big part of this game because without Nate Biddle to back up and follow Dante who got hurt, then he got sick. He's lost a bunch of weight. He's not expected to play and, you know, has been out for a long time. Oregon's production at the center position is reduced to defense and rebounding only with Mo Diawara. And Mo Diawara is a big body. He'll come in, play hard. He, he, he can defend. He's not elite, but he, he can. He's certainly capable of it, but he'll give you nothing at the offensive end. Whereas when Dante's on the floor, they run a lot of things through him and a lot of pick and rolls with him. That's been the most lethal part of Oregon's offense that changed from the early part of the year is they use Dante a lot more in the pick and roll. And he's very, very good with Jermaine Kuznard or Jackson Shellstad, who can also hit mid-range shots. So I, I think how it gets officiated it is indeed a, a curious factor because if Dante gets into foul trouble, Oregon's got problems. Oregon's got problems and they, they'd have to just go crazy from three. Yeah. And Spencer, to work off of your point, you just made about the pick and roll actions with, uh, with and follow Dante BJ Max probably weakest um the weakest part of his game defensively I would argue outside of obvious size disadvantages which will be the case here against Dante so he goes up against him it is pick and roll defense um Auburn for example the first time South Carolina played Auburn granted it's Auburn they literally run 10 guys deep and it was in the jungle and Neville Arena uh, it's tough to win at that place no matter who it is but they just ate South Carolina's front court alive with pick and rolls from the top of the key so that could be something else to watch as well. But for South Carolina, look, I just said what I said about the Pac-12 and how those teams play. Oregon fans might suspect South Carolina, you come from the SEC, there's a lot more physical play. So therefore, there might be a tighter whistle on the Gamecocks in this tournament. South Carolina is one of the better teams in the country at not fouling. I believe Oregon also falls in that category as well. Because again, South Carolina, they're not going to try to go for a bunch of steals. They're not going to try to full court pressure or anything like that. They're just going to try to stay in front of you and basically just say, you're a great shooter, fine. You're going to have to make every shot above my hand right in front of your face. That's the way that they're going to defend. So where South Carolina might try to get other teams to foul trouble is B.J. Mack and Colin Murray Boyles, more so B.J. Mack. B.J. Mack will work in the low post for five, sometimes seven, eight seconds. Maybe sometimes he stays in the lane too long and it doesn't get called. That's also, again, college basketball now. You never hear three seconds anymore in the lane. But BJ will be willing to go to work, and you know he can also pump fake. He's very crafty at that because he is also a fifth-year guy. So that might be how they try to get uh, Dante out of the game if they have to resort to that. I think that Oregon's absolute maximum ceiling – would be making the Elite Eight. I don't think this is a Final Four team. I've been wrong about predictions in March before. I think if they get through this South Carolina team that certainly had a good year and is not here by way of an automatic qualifier. Remember, Oregon was trying to build an at-large resume throughout the season. They came up short too many times in a couple of key opportunities, had a loss or two that they shouldn't have taken. They had to win the Pac-12 tournament, and they did. That can lead a team to feel very confident. So coming into this game, how confident is South Carolina with the season they've had? And, and what do you feel like their potential is if they're able to beat the Ducks in round one? Spencer, I think that the Gamecocks feel very confident going into this game because of everything that they've done this year. You throw in the fact that a lot of national media members seem to be kind of picking Oregon as a trendy upset pick on that very six, much so. 11 seed line. Yep. That's just going to add some fuel to the fire for South Carolina that, you know, we're still being doubted despite everything we accomplished. But in terms of the ceiling, I think you can beat Oregon. Creighton is the team, in my opinion, that will worry Gamecock fans the most. Creighton's full of shooters. Obviously, Baylor Shireman leads that group over there. Tennessee, I would actually say South Carolina's not scared of them if you meet you match up with them in the Sweet 16. They've beaten them once before. They've given Tennessee two really, really good fights in the SEC. Um, but I think that they could make it to the Elite Eight if everything falls their way. But of course, Oregon could also upset them on Thursday, and they could dash all that away. So I think that they could definitely get past the first round. Absolute ceiling, Elite Eight probably against Purdue. 
Yeah, I I won't be surprised if Oregon loses the game. I won't be surprised if Oregon gets to the Elite Eight. I think both things are, 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 are that possible in March. And yeah, Oregon got here because they won the conference tournament, but that doesn't mean that they aren't a team that can play at that sort of level. I mean, they had to beat Arizona along the way to get here. And I think that, you know, in traditional Dana Altman fashion, Oregon's playing its best basketball in the month of March. And that's when you want to be playing your best basketball here. And Oregon's battled injuries throughout the year. So it's been really, really difficult for them to find consistent play, but they seem to have found it right now. And I think, you know, Dana Altman is is someone who a lot of people are going to pick in this game. Am I included in that? I'll give you a hint. Yeah, I, I am most definitely. And we'll get to our game predictions and we'll talk about the man who does nothing but align Rubik's Cubes. First, we talk about our friends at Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Yukon Huskies are the Nissan Armada, top overall seed in the NCAA tournament, as hardcore as it gets. No wonder they're the top seed in the East region, one of the favorites to win it all. The Auburn Tigers are the Nissan Pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch, created a lane for themselves, claiming the top spot in the SEC and winning the conference tournament over Florida. And the Oregon Ducks are, of course, this week's Nissan Rogue. They have to be, not just because I host Locked on Ducks, but because Oregon surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They say, win life, go Rogue. And that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them out at NissanUSA.com. So one reason that Oregon is a trendy upset pick of sorts, and look, it's an 11-6 matchup. The six seeds are not going undefeated. The 11 seeds are not going undefeated. These matchups are 3-1 and one at, at worst, oftentimes 2-2. Two and two. I think that the reason is Dana Altman and and Dana Altman almost alone. And Folly Dante is playing at an insanely high level at, at, at both ends of the floor. He impacts the game defensively with his, re, he's a great rebounder, his shot blocking, he can test shots. He's done a pretty good job for the most part, staying out of foul troubles. We talked about that's going to be big in this game, but each of the last two times, and there have only been two instances in which Oregon won the Pac-12 tournament and that was the only way they could make the big dance, Oregon has made the Sweet 16. And both times they lost to the eventual national champion back in 2013, they lost to Louisville. And in 2019, they lost to Virginia. So they did those, they, they accomplished those things as a 12 seed both times. Here they're an 11. I think that history is one of those mythical statistics that you pull out that makes people have a light bulb go on in their head of like, oh, it has to happen. Of course, I do have Oregon going to the Sweet 16. Maybe I'm biased. Maybe I'm looking too much into what I just told you. But that, I think, is the biggest reason is Dana Altman just Rubik's Cubes, man. He just aligns the Rubik's Cubes. Spencer, I'll definitely give you props for the Rubik's Cube uh, reference there with Dana Altman. And, and look... I have heard Dana Altman, he is phenomenal in the NCAA tournament. I absolutely give him props for that. I believe he's never lost a first-round game. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. That sounds right. I will double-check that right now. Okay, well, while you double-check that, here's why South Carolina is going to win this game. So, Dana Altman, great coach, probably the more nationally known coach in this matchup. But Lamont Paris for South Carolina, folks, he's the SEC Coach of the Year in this conference. And there's a reason why he is one of, I believe just 10 semifinalists at this point for Naismith national coach of the year. Lamont Paris is cerebral within the game. He is great at pushing buttons, knowing when to take a player out, when to make a defensive change South Carolina, by the way, if they have issues keeping Oregon from driving to the basket, which, you know, it sounds like it's more so three point shots and feed the ball down low. But if Oregon does have success driving, South Carolina will run a one, three, one zone at times. And they have been fantastic with that zone defense this year, but they only will pull it out when they feel like they have to. So that's also something to watch in this game. But 
Lamont Paris has been great this season, and I think that he's become a lot more well-known in men's college basketball because of what he's done with this team, a team that probably does not have that superstar kind of talent, like maybe a Dante for Oregon or in this region, a Dalton Connect for the Tennessee Volunteers. He's done more with less. Another thing I want to look at real quickly, going back to matchups for just a second, Oregon, I believe, has a freshman point guard coming into this game in Jackson mm-hmm. Shellstadt. Jackson Shellstad is going to go up against two fourth or fifth year players at that guard spot that have both been to the tournament before in Taylon Cooper and Michi Johnson. Now, South Carolina is, again, not going to be aggressive. They're not going to try to steal the ball all game long. But I think the veteran presence at that backcourt for South Carolina going against a freshman point guard, I think that that is something that's going to help this matchup tilt South Carolina's way. South Carolina has played against talented freshman guards before with the Kentucky Wildcats. They absolutely owned that matchup. Now, granted, it was back in January, and they also had this at home. This is much different. It's the NCAA tournament. It's neutral court, just mano a mano. Who's going to be the better man for 40 minutes? But I think that that's something that's going to help South Carolina and maybe work to partly negate the advantage they might have down low with and folly Dante. Last thing I want to say, and I already alluded to it, Oregon has been a trendy upset pick in this game. The Gamecocks were picked dead last in the SEC preseason poll back this past mm. October. Mm. South Carolina wound up doing so good this season. Obviously, they're 16 in the tournament. But going back to conference play, they were fighting for an SEC regular season title with the Tennessee Volunteers the last week of the regular season. So beware of overlooking South Carolina. I know it's been seven years since they've been in the tournament, but the Gamecocks are here to play. And by the way, fun fact, Last time the Final Four was in Arizona, guess what? Frank Martin, the then head coach, and the Gamecocks were in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're going to make it all the way. Just saying. It could be something magical about Arizona and South Carolina when the Final Four is situated there. So I say all that to say this. I got the Gamecocks winning this game. Okay, so uh, just to confirm what, what, what you thought and what is indeed correct, Dana Altman has never lost a first-round NCAA tournament game as Oregon's head coach. In fact, in every postseason tournament he's ever been in, he's always reached at least the second round. His postseason appearances go like this. CBI champion, NIT quarterfinals, Sweet 16, round of 32, round of 32, Elite 8, Final 4, NIT round 2, Sweet 16, no tournament, but Peyton Pritchard certainly would have won at least one game in there because that team was rolling with PP3 at the helm. Now they've got a different number three point guard from Westland. Sweet 16, NIT second round, NIT quarters, and now this season. So that's a pretty strong track record. And why Oregon's a trendy pick, I think this is a go-either-way game, but I like the Ducks here. I'm with Vegas, though. I think this is very low scoring. I think it could just barely clip the over, but I won't be surprised if it goes under here. I think like a 70, 65, you know, no one is scoring more than 72 points in this game. Anybody who does is winning. I I think, I think we'd probably agree on that, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I think the first team to go over or to hit 75 or above that, that team is winning. I do not see the winner of this game coming out with a, you know, 81, 78, you know, just, absolute shootout and an explosion of offense. I don't see that happening. I think one team is going to struggle with the other team's defense because both have been really good this year and Oregon is particularly dialed in. I trust Dana Altman and they can just hit a couple threes. Not a lot, not a lot, just a couple of threes. If J.J. Tracy can maybe hit one or two threes. If K.J. Evans could hit a triple here and there, he's been very streaky from beyond the arc. If Shel- Shelstad or Kuznard, one of them needs to hit multiple threes. If that happens, if you get two or three threes from the combination of Tracy and Evans, and you get multiple threes from either Kuznard or Shelstad, I think Oregon's offense will be in a really, really good spot. But I, I'm I'm stoked for this game. I, I know all of you are as well because it's it's March Madness. It just it it doesn't get any bet. There is no better sporting event in the world than March Madness. And I'm you know just happy at some level that Oregon is in the tournament and will have a chance. But like I said earlier, I think the likelihood that they make the Elite Eight is almost the same as them you know losing this first round game. In that 
it's so reasonable. It's so possible that I'm going to be absolutely dialed in and watching. So I've, I've got Oregon winning. Andrew, I know you've got South Carolina, but uh, any final thoughts? I'll be kind and give you the last word here if you would like it. One last little fun fact going into this game. The magic number is going to be 70. I believe that outside or of one or two times this season, when South Carolina has held their opponent to less than 70 points, they've won. So if you're Oregon, the number you want to hit is 70. If you hit that, then there's a higher likelihood the Ducks come out on top. But if you don't hit that, then South Carolina will likely be the team going to the round of 32. Andrew Lyon locked on at Gamecocks. I'm Spencer McLaughlin locked on Ducks. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this crossover episode. Hope you enjoy the game as well. We'll see you next time. And until then, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.